So, how do you know where to use shorter or longer posts? First, to give you a sense of what we mean by shorter versus longer, generally at Triple Creek we've used posts between 8 and 12 feet long, although some were as short as 6 feet and as long as 14 and a half feet. Now, when we use different post lengths for different purposes, and I can show, yeah, the banks are sort of, you know, uniformly high on both sides. Um, the stream, the deepest part of a stream, here's your cool word for the day. It's called a thalweg, T-H-A-L-W-E-G. And the deepest part of the stream is the thalweg. And so the thalweg, you know, in this case would be, you know, out here maybe. Um, so you gotta get posts down in the thalweg that are well below the potential scour depth. And so even, and, and then, so all the posts are driven pretty deep. And then as you get up onto the banks, you want to drive them at least as deep because as we saw this year, you know, the water will tend to flank around the sides of it and erode it. So if you didn't drive them at least as deep as the ones in the stream bed in the thalweg, then you'd basically have your posts tip over and float away. So we're trying to drive them all uniformly deep, but we use different post lengths to kind of get to that. Now, if we're going to talk about post length, we also need to talk about percent embedment. Like Robes mentioned, typically burying the post 50% has worked well for us as a general guideline. However, we'll discuss the considerations for embedment here too. A longer post may be reflected in the final product as a taller BDA, or the extra length may be found subsurface. If you feel you can confidently estimate the percentage of discharge that will pass over the BDA versus through the BDA versus onto the floodplain or into a side channel, you may be able to use a sophisticated tool to estimate the percent embedment required. This tool may take into account the loading forces involved with debris that may rack up on the BDA and other forces that will be at play. However, given the vast number of variables that can affect these estimates, we have developed a basic system for choosing post length and percent embedment. Here's a situational approach that we've been using. So in general, we aim for 50% embedment. Certain situations call for greater than 50%. The total post length is then determined based on how much post should remain above ground after hopefully achieving the desired embedment. The post height left standing is limited by how deeply you can install the posts. So if you know from experience that you can't pound deeper than 4 feet, then your post should not be more than 8 feet tall. Once you've successfully installed posts 6 or 7 feet deep, you know that you can use posts 12 or 14 feet long, if warranted. If you're really not sure how deep you're going to be able to install your posts, you can always err on the side of starting with a somewhat longer post knowing that you can always cut it shorter. You can't cut it longer. So you do have options if you start longer. When deciding how long to make your posts, you may want to start by looking closely at the channel in each BDA location. And notice if it's wide and shallow or a deep trench with high stream power. Is there room for high flows to move laterally or is the stream confined to a trench with vertical cut banks? What's the slope like? Post length and depth decisions are driven by the site specific hydraulic and hydrologic conditions in relation to what you need the post lines to do. For example, if the post line will not span the channel and you intend for it to primarily induce meandering and recruit sediment from the bank, determining post length will be different than for a channel spanning dam that you intend to aggrade sediment with. Also, the percent that needs to be embedded varies depending on where the post is going. Here are some examples of places that call for more than 50% embedment and therefore may require longer posts. If the posts are driven into the banks at the end of a BDA, 
They need to be exceptionally long so that you can get down below the scour depth because you may expect flanking. A longer post in this case gives you a greater margin of safety should scour occur. The tip of a deflector dam can undergo extreme tip scour and those posts should be driven more than 50%. Posts in and around the thawweg should be installed as deeply as possible, which may be greater than 50%, depending on the situation. If you're pounding into newly aggraded, unconsolidated sediment, you're going to need a longer post and aim for greater than 50% embedment. In other words, as you aggrade, you need to increase your embedment at that location in order to still get some of the post into firm substrate. Here are some examples of places where 50% embedment works well. In the body of a deflector dam where the pressure will be minimal because the structure is changing the direction of flow but it's not resisting as much stream power. Or within the wetted width portions of channel spanning dams being installed into consolidated substrate. Another place where it may be a safe bet to use shorter posts at 50% embedment would be in smaller channels with lower flows, where the structures will be under less pressure. Also, keep in mind that with enough redundancy, the structures can support each other and reduce pressure for each other, um, which can result in each structure not needing to be quite as robust. What about the length of post left standing above the stream bed? In the middle of a channel spanning dam, posts can be short if you want the foul wag to continue traveling in the center of the stream. So this is a bit of an extreme example of where you can leave the post shorter in the middle and taller on the sides to direct flow to the middle of the channel to help ensure that the foul wag will not move to the side and cause flanking and to relieve some of the hydrostatic pressure by allowing flows to go over the posts in the middle. Now, if you leave the middle of the BDA substantially lower than the rest of the structure and high flows end up overtopping the structure significantly, then you may not be able to capture as much sediment as you otherwise would. It may not be tall enough to interact with high flows as much with less of a flow and sediment interruption than you may desire. As a result, bed load may be carried downstream instead of a grading. Um, but that's kind of a trade-off between increasing your sediment capture and increasing the stability of the structure by reducing the amount of hydrostatic pressure that occurs when the stream and the structure interact. However, generally most of our flow direction work has been done by adjusting the weave rather than the post height so that we can try and direct flows one way or the other depending on where the weaving is lowest. Regardless of the post height, you can always adjust the height of the weave to direct flows either in the middle or to another direction as desired. Where else do you want the posts to be less tall? Well, if you build several BDAs in succession to limit the plunge heights and, and backwater each BDA, like a series of structures stepping up, you might start with shorter posts downstream or even use shorter posts throughout because the grade control is being accomplished over a larger number of structures in tandem. This way, one structure doesn't need as much height in order to bring the stream up X number of inches or feet overall. 
This is generally the most stable way to design BDAs. Keep in mind, however, that the shorter post can actually be less stable in situations with plunge scour on the downstream side. For example, with a six foot post, if you embed it three feet, but it scours a foot on the downstream side, now you only have two feet or 30% embedment. Whereas if you had a 10 foot post embedded five feet and you lost that one foot of substrate, you would still have 40% embedment. In other words, you can increase the percent of the post that remains embedded even after some downstream scour occurs. You have a really big waterfall off the back, you get a lot of scour and your post just goes away. So the closer, the smaller those little waterfalls, the smaller those steps here at the bottom, the better off we are. The waterfall at high flow, well, the way to reduce the height of that waterfall isn't up there, but down here. So if we back this one up, it affects that one, and then that one and that one. So that's why we always work from downstream to up when we weave these, and that gives you a way to control it throughout the whole project reach, and it does become cumulative. A lot can be learned about making design decisions, such as post length, from observing how the structures have interacted with the stream so far. Most of our posts have failed when there's been excessive scour over the top, which removes bed material in front of the BDA that had been holding the posts up. You can mitigate for that scour by building a beefy brush mattress, a technique that will be covered in a different video segment. You can also use shorter posts, especially if the stream has high slope or a lot of stream power confined in a trench and you expect a lot of scour, you can use a shorter post length and a greater number of structures to help maintain stability. Conversely, if the location is low gradient with plenty of lateral space on terraces to disperse stream power, and if you protect the bed material with a substantial brush mattress, you may be able to go with longer and taller posts. Why would you want taller posts? Well, first, you want to make sure the upper end of the post is having an effect at high flow. You need to try to anticipate the stage height during high flows and determine how tall a post would need to be in order to function optimally. Once you know roughly how high the stream may get, you can determine what post length will keep the BDA actively interacting with the stream during high flows. If all of your posts are short and they're very quickly over top during most high flow conditions, they're not going to do as much work as they could. This also means they're not subject to as much resistance and may be less prone to leaning forward, flanking, or otherwise failing. And you have to weigh those risks with how much work you want the structures to do. Second, if you anticipate a large amount of aggradation to happen quickly, you may want your structures to function for more than one or two years. By having taller posts, you leave your options open for later years to adjust the weave in a different way, depending on how things have changed. At Triple Creek, some of our structures became buried in the first year, and it would have been great if the posts had been a little longer and could have also done some work the next year. So know that the longer the post is, the longer it will take to install it, which increases cost. However, know also that the shorter the post is, the quicker it will be buried in sediment. And if that requires installing a whole new post line, that increases the cost even more in the long term. So where it's possible to use taller posts and add weave material over multiple years, you can invest a little more time up front but reap the benefit in future years if the BDA remains stable. Keep in mind that if you have a lot of debris in your system and not very many BDAs upstream of your structure, you may rack up debris on the posts, which will likely change the way the water interacts with the BDA and is likely to increase the shear force. 
This hasn't been a major factor on our project because of the high number of BDAs that share the debris load, which is relatively low to begin with. So this is why we've never trimmed our BDA posts after installing them. It has been helpful to us to have that additional height for raising the weave as the stream bed degrades. When choosing your post length, you'll want to take into account your risk profile. For example, if you have low risk and lots of time versus if you have some infrastructure concerns, um, some real time constraints, or low tolerance for post failure. Overall, you know, we want to balance our reach scale goals with our site specific goals. So we may be reactionary on a small scale in terms of what's happening at each structure but we're keeping in mind the overall goal, whether that be to raise an incised stream bed, increase groundwater storage, and or retime flows so that on the whole, there's more water later in the season. So there is no cookie cutter method that we can offer for making these decisions, but before you agonize over each choice of post length, Remember that by building enough structures to provide redundancy and by introducing roughness to the reach, overall you can successfully meet your objectives even if the way the structures interact with the stream is different than you intended.